just a brief inter inter not interruption introduction <laughs> oh um, Barry Smith works in ontology which is extraordinarily influential in it a subfield of computer science which has its roots in philosophy um, his ontological ideas and methods have been applied successfully in biology and medicine and I believe he is beginning a project to apply them to economics he has an extraordinary number of uh, honors honors uh, that's how you're supposed to do it um, he is the co-author, among other things, of building ontologies with basic formal ontology. That is to say, again, one of the basic works in the field. He has also, perhaps single-handedly, made philosophy something applied and used. Um, the perhaps ultimate test of that is that the Defense Department you know, has used his applied ontologies to form part of their international standards. Uh, in effect, the Defense Department is really interested in things working, and they think his philosophy works. It is quite a tribute. Um, I won't give you, again, all his honors, but I'm extraordinarily honored, and the NAS is extraordinarily honored. He's a board member. Oh, yes, and he's a former board member of the National Association of Scholars. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I was trying to work out why I was uh, invited to give the dinner speech. And I decided that, that they thought I was just going to be doing philosophy, and that's not very important. And so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the layman crash, but most of it is going to be built around cytokine chemistry. So you're going to get cytokine chemistry good and hard. Um, We'll start with medicine. So this is the former dean of the medical school in Harvard. And uh, he's, f he's noted for having given the same address to the medical students. The new medical students, when they arrived each year, telling them that 50% of what they were going to learn was going to turn out to be false. And no one knew which was which. <laughs> and of course, he was wrong. So. It 99.93% of what they learn is going to be true because it's all boring. <laughs> so there are many, many boring truths. And um, these are the things that they learn during their uh, studies. Most of them, they know, know them already. They just never saw them written down. And uh, as Pascal pointed out, too much truth is disgusting. <laughs> so no one thinks about all of these boring truths. Of course, because they're boring, but they're still true. Now, most truths are boring, which means most truths are not going to get published. And you're not going to get rewarded. I'm, most of what I'm saying now is boring, of course. <laughs> But I'm not going to get rewarded for saying this because it's obvious. Now, what this means is that discovering interesting truths is really hard. And, um, and that's why most published research findings are false. Because they're really hard to find, these interesting truths. But as we've seen already it's on several occasions today, there is a, a very important set of incentives for people to publish. Um, all right. Now, Ioannidis, in his paper, showed the various marks which go hand in hand with published results. So there, uh, there are studies which are focused on a rather narrow domain Effect sizes are relatively small. There is, uh, there, are, there is a greater number of combinations so that you can, you can select just those combinations which seem interesting. And because you're selecting, there will in fact not be statistically significant combinations for the entire possible sample, but you will have a, significant, uh, a statistically significant result. And it's going to be even better if the result is in an area where there are strong incentives to publish, for instance, of a 
financial nature. So, if it's interesting, it's probably false. Uh, so, there are lots of statistically significant correlations. And if you, if you work hard enough, you'll find a few. Um, so, let's find a few. We're going to design a cafeteria which will optimize the degree to which people eat healthy food. This is in a, a student residence hall, let's say. So you're going to change the color scheme, you're going to change the size and shape of the tables, the, the size and shape of the chairs, the music in the background, even the pricing. And you collect data on all of these possible combinations. Just colors gives you dozens and dozens of combinations. And then you go through them and you find out which of these combinations had a statistically significant correlation with healthy eating. And you publish a paper. That's called p-hacking. <laughs> All right, now this is an interesting case because it led to a TED talk. And I, so many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this example. So this is Amy Cuddy, who has a free no-tech life hack for anyone who needs to take a job interview or speak in public. And it goes like this. you a free no tech life hack um, and all it requires of you is this that you change your posture for two minutes powerful people tend to be not surprisingly more assertive and more confident uh, more, more optimistic they actually feel that they're going to win even at games of chance uh, they also tend to be able to think more abstractly so there are a lot of differences we have this evidence both that the body can shape the mind, at least at the facial level, um, and also that role changes can shape the mind. So what happens if you take a role change, um, what happens if you do that at a really minimal level? Like this tiny manipulation, this tiny intervention, for two minutes you say, I want you to stand like this, and it's going to make you feel more powerful. So this is what we did. We decided to uh, bring people into the lab and run a little experiment. And these people adopted for two minutes either high power poses or low power poses. They come in, they sit into a vial. We, for two minutes, say, you need to do this or this. They don't look at pictures of the poses. We don't want to prime them with the concept of power. We want them to be feeling power, right? So two minutes they do this. We then ask them, how powerful do you feel on a series of items? And then we give them an opportunity to gamble. And then we take another saliva sample. That's it. That's the whole experiment. So this is what we find. Risk tolerance, which is the gambling. What we find is that when you're, not, when the, when you're in the high power pose condition, 86% of you will gamble. When, when you're in the low power pose condition, only 60%. And that's a pretty whopping significant difference. Here's what we find on testosterone. From their baseline when they come in, high power people experience about a 20% increase and low power people experience about a 10% decrease. So again, two minutes and you get these changes. Okay, so she did very well. Um, so, so this is the t one of the 20 online talks that can change your life in The Guardian. But then things started to go wrong. So. The, the, her co-author, I, I, for a long time, Amy Cuddy continued to defend this result. But her co-author concluded that she did not believe that the effects were real. And gradually speaking, the, the, the influence of Amy Cuddy on the power pose um, question uh, waned. Okay, so this is just one example of many, many examples, of, uh, particularly in psychology, uh, but also, as we shall see, in other areas. Um, and so the question is, how do we solve this problem? And the first attempt uh, was in psychology in the, uh, the so-called reproducibility project, which sought to replicate 100 studies in psychology, which were published in three leading journals. And um, it, it's very well documented. It, the amazing statistics, amazing uh, attention to detail went into this project. And... Um, 
the, the, uh, the result of the project was 36% of the studies replicated and the rest were um, that they did not replicate. And even the ones that did replicate, the effects were smaller than claimed in the papers. Now, this is, these are just a couple of examples. Currency priming. So if you're just exposed to money then this increases your endorsement of the current social system. So I can show you a dollar bill if you like. Um, imagined contact. Merely imagining contact with members of ethnic outgroups is sufficient to reduce prejudice. And many more. So this is a Gary Larson one. Um, so research, the, the, the participants were asked to, to either hold a pen between their teeth or between their lips. If it's between your teeth, you smile. If it's between your lips, you pout. People smiled. People who were forced to smile because of the pen between their teeth found the, the, the cartoons funnier. And the conclusion is that if you change your expression on your face, this will change your mood. So this is the, uh, the idea. Smiling can make you happier. Uh, it didn't replicate. <laughs> or, now, it's not just psychology, it also in chemistry, and this is an amazing result. So there is a, a journal called Organic Chemistry. And Organic Chemistry, uh, Organic Syntheses. Organic Syntheses is a journal about organic syntheses. <laughs> and um, from the very beginning, they have verified every single submission to the journal by synthesizing the molecule that the journal described as having been synthesized. So it's an easy way to replicate. And uh, they didn't. So 7.5% of the submissions in in uh, the years 2010 to 2016 did not replicate. In other words, it was not possible to synthesize a molecule that was described in the paper. And as the editor says, most chemists would consider that this is frightening because every other kind of chemistry is much harder. And so presumably every other kind of chemistry is even less replicating than here. All right, so... The, the, of course, the 7.5% the, the per papers may fail for innocent reasons. It could be that they made a mistake in describing the, the, the methods used for synthesis. We, we'll come back to the issue of describing methods used in scientific uh, results later on. But, of course, there are other reasons. Um, so sometimes the methods were not described clearly enough, for instance. And ontology which David referred to earlier, is, it steps in at this point. So ontology is all about describing things in ways that other people can understand. All right, now it holds in medicine. I understand that in medicine there are incentives to publish more than perhaps is wise. So there was um, a study which was done, which I'm sure is replicatable, which says that around $28 billion worth of research in medicine is non-reproducible. So let's see some examples. So um, autism is a, a, a popular area of, res of research and the various problems which arise in other areas arise also here. So, and we've had some of this earlier in the oceanic interlude earlier. Um, so you, you mislead the significance of your findings in the title and abstract. Uh, you, uh, you, you have an assertion about ep uh, environmental effects. Uh, you have a small sample size. You test multiple factors for association, which may or may not be a mark of some p-hacking going on in the background. Only one of those, however, shows any association, which is another mark of p-hacking going on in the background. And then your statistics are corrected. You do multiple tests. Maybe you're trying to find the one that gives you a statistically significant result. We saw some of that earlier today also. And so on and so on. So um, this, is, I, this is typical, not just of autism, but of research in other areas of medicine. For very good reasons, understandable reasons. So they did the reproducibility project for cancer biology. 
And again, the goal was to replicate some important results uh, of relevance to cancer published in leading journals in, in a two-year period. And again, uh, some, well, here it was somewhat more problematic. So the authors of some of the journals which in the original analysis, the authors of some of the papers which in the original an analysis were found not to have replicated, argued that they did replicate or that the attempts at replication had not been accurate. And this shows that, to, and, and I know some of the people here involved here, in fact one of them I'm going to refer to later, these are honest scientists. And so the issue of replicatability or reproducibility is by no means trivial, particularly not in an area like cancer biology or any area of human biology, because every sample of humans that you run through your methodology is going to be different from every other sample that other people run through, their met through, through your methodology. All right, so p-hacking we've already talked about. It thrives where the methods are secret. Uh, it thrives where data is published using secret codes or where the data is not published at all. We've seen some of that today also. So, go back to our list of solutions. The next solution, stop publishing. <laughs> now, this is not a joke. I, 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 everything I say is intended seriously. Um, it's published research findings that cause the problems. Um, and in medicine, of course, to publish go, goes hand in hand with owning the data, owning the results. So it's, it's a highly valuable incentive to non-replicatable work if the only way to get your work out into the world is through publication. So Atoll Butte, who is just a few miles from here, just up the bay, uh, seriously proposes getting rid of publishing in medicine. The idea is that medical research now is, is almost entirely a computational process. People collect huge amounts of data and then people like Atul, who is a very clever computer hacker, as well as being a brilliant medical scientist, is able to extract value out of these computational data within hours. He needs to get the data immediately and then share it with the people who have also analyzed the data and they don't need to go through the six months of writing a paper and another three months of getting it refereed and, 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 and so forth. He can have the data in the hands of potential patients who can profit from the new drug which has just been tested within a couple of days. That's at all. So, the idea would be that all the data from clinical trials, for instance, should be made available immediately. And that the publishing process, it's, 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 a, it's a, a, an institution from a former millennium. Um, and making the data open has all kinds of secondary consequences, some of which we've discussed already today. All right, so another popular solution is called registration. Now, I don't know how many of you looked at the backs of the doors in the uh, Best Western Hotel today, but it, your, your rooms all cost $999.00 per night. Now, why is that? Well, c the California state government requires that uh, hoteliers will be fined if they charge more than the amount posted on the backs of the door. <laughs> now, so all hoteliers have to post the maximal amount that they can charge. On, that's called pre-registration. And it tells us that pre-registration doesn't necessarily bring any benefits. Pre-registration is not as e easy a thing to require than you might imagine. Now, this is where I talk about the Lehman Brothers. The cytokine chemistry is coming and you will really enjoy it. <laughs> so, why did the Lehman Brothers crash? Well, everybody in the financial services industry discovered that they could 
um, that, that there was a way of making a lot of money even when the real estate market was not necessarily on its firmest footing, and that was through what were called collateralized debt obligations. People did not really understand collateralized debt obligations, and that was probably in part intended that people did not understand. And now why were the collateralized debt obligations and the collateralized debt obligations squared and cubed and to the fourth part, why were they hidden? Well, it wasn't true that they were hidden. Some people knew what any given collateralization rested on, but other people did not. And how you find out in any given case was very difficult. And so this is what it looks like. This is a simple case. Um, so that down here are the residential mortgage payments. And up at the top are the, well, anyway. So Lehman crashed because in the 48 hours, the weekend, when the uh, process was entered into it, trying to resolve all the creditors and debtors of Lehman, they couldn't get all the information in time. And so uh, $75 billion of value was lost because of hidden assets. So you just couldn't... Uh, Lehman was much richer than people supposed. It was still probably not rich enough, but it was, it, a lot of money was in layman's hands legally and properly. It's just no one could find it. A lot of value, I should say. So the Dodd-Frank Act instituted pre-registration as a solution to this problem. I actually think it's a good solution to the problem um, insofar as it goes. Of course, it's not been tested yet. The idea of the Dodd-Frank Act was that every large-scale financial services organization, like Lehman, had to have a living will, which means a resolution plan, which means a plan which will enable them to resolve all their debts and all their credits within 48 hours, which is going to mean use of computers. The computer has to be able to find all of those things and resolve them within 48 hours uh, to unwind all the derivatives. And so they, they introduce a registration system which includes a so-called legal entity identifier. When you create a collateralized debt obligation, you create a new company. So the bank doesn't own this thing. The new company is formed so that it, if it crashes, the bank will not be uh, affected. So there are hundreds and thousands of new companies being created and resolved o o over periods of months and years. All of them have to be identified and findable. And so a legal entity identifier contains all of this information. And then the idea is that you can use the, all of this information in order to resolve the, um, the company in the required 48-hour period. Now, this is working. There are now, uh, when this, uh, more, there are more in Canada, actually. There are 27,000 LEIs which have been issued to institutions in Canada, 16,500 in America, and then... Uh, uh, oh, no, sorry. I, uh, I take it back. Canada... Anyway, a lot. All right, so, and there are mandates. So 45 countries have mandated use of legal entity identifiers in order to create living wills, just as the, the FDA mandates pre-registration of all clinical trials. So pre-registration can be mandated by governments. And if it's mandated by governments, and if it's done right, it's probably uh, doing some good. So how is this working in science? I mean, clinical trials are science too, but now I'm talking about other kinds of science. So there's something called the Center for Open Science, which received a million dollars from some friendly beneficiary, whose name is John. I've forgotten his last name. Uh, Arnold, thank you. Um, for, uh, to bribe scientists to pre-register. So the idea was that they designed their experiment, they pre-register, which means they register the design of the experiment, and then they collect their data, analyze it, publish it, and then they get $1,000. They did this a thousand times. 
And the registration involved registering all hypotheses, all outcomes, all statistical models, techniques, variables, and so forth. And this, this has various consequences. It creates an audit trail. So you can see what they said they were going to do, and then you can check that they did it. It cuts down redundancy because other people can see that they already said they were going to do that, so probably you shouldn't say that you're going to do it too. That only works if people check the registry. Um, and it, it, to a certain degree, it does guarantee reproducibility because you've specified how to reproduce. Now, we've seen already on several occasions today that there are a few incentives to try and replicate other people's experiments. But still, it, it, at least it makes it possible to try and replicate. All right, now, registration was fashionable. I, I, I don't think it worked to the degree or with the success that, that was hoped initially, but it's still, it's, it's an ongoing thing. Uh, there are also now registration badges, which you can attach to a paper to demonstrate that it was pre-registered. And now, slightly more interestingly, there is pre-review, peer review, uh, not just registration now, but peer review prior to conducting an experiment. And many journals uh, listed at this link here um, are um, allowing people to have their study design peer reviewed before they perform the experiment. Now, this obviously is beneficial. It saves you time if it's a bad design. Here, also, you have a possibility of reducing redundancy because people can identify a design as being one that they've already seen in another experiment. And, uh, and then you have a, a second stage of peer review where you actually hand in the report and the people who have, the, the journals who have adopted this model, uh, not as a, a requirement but as an option, are also committing themselves to publishing negative results and to publishing boring repetitions of results. Um, so, and you can find a list of the various different kinds of studies and reports uh, on the Open Science Framework website, and it's quite an interesting list. Uh, so this, this one that's highlighted here is called A Closer Look at the Size of the Gaze Liking Effect, which I guess won't replicate, but I'm, I'm just guessing. Um, all right, now the big problem here, and we really are now getting to cytokine chemistry, is how and where... How is the important thing? How are the materials, hypotheses, and so on to be described? Because if everyone can use their own words, and if some people are very clear, but other people are, for whatever reason, not quite so clear, then how are they going to produce a good description which really will ensure um, reproducibility? Now, there is one very interesting uh, attempt to uh, uh, tackle this problem, which is a, a, a company called Protocols.io, which has engaged in collaborations with the Center for Open Science, with various journals, in order to help people not so much answer the question of how these methods and hypotheses are described, but where they are to be described. Because Protocols.io is a repository for describing, for descriptions of methods, protocols. And it's great. So I, 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 it's a very impressive, it's very successful, it solves a major problem. And um, you, can, you, you can create a free account. So for normal mortals, it's free. Um, and this is Lenny Tatelman, who is the owner of protocols.io. And um, this is the gentleman that uh, Peter referred to yesterday. Um, as I say, this is heroic work that he's performing, and he's performing it successfully. And I'm sure he doesn't have time to do anything else with his life other than perform this successful work. So, as he says, given that we have protocols.io, then there are no more excuses for non-reproducible methods. Everyone can upload their methods to... Um, to protocols.io. Now, how does, 
How does he finance protocols.io? Well, it's free for human beings, but companies have to pay. And companies, companies pay, for instance, reagent vendors, uh, vendors of chemicals, site, uh, uh, antibodies, for instance. They pay because then they can glean from protocols.io aggregate, aggregated data which will help their businesses. So everyone wins. We solve the reprodu reproducibility problem and uh, vendors of antibodies can help to finance the solution. So this is an example of, of one such millipore sigma, one such company, which is selling uh, an antibody related to uh, a molecule called CCL15. That's a cytokine. Just remember that. And you can, it's $409 for 100 milligrams, so it's a, it's a deal. I recommend that you do not go to this site because by the next morning, every single web page that you open will have an advertisement from uh, millipore.sigma trying, trying to sell you antibodies. This is another CCL15 antibody, this time from a company called R&D Systems. Now, we're interested in this CCL15 because the immunologists, and we're talking now about immunology, are notorious for inventing different labels for one and the same molecule. So there are at least 63 labels in English, in, in the Roman font, for CCL15. Now humans who are experts, they know their way around this minefield and they, they know how to tell whether something is the same cytokine or a different cytokine. But computers, they're a bit s stupid. <laughs> And it's good if computers can keep track of whether it's one cytokine or two. So let's see how protocols.io manages here. Because if protocols.io really is the answer to all of the maiden's prayer, then it's going to do well on cytokines. So if you put CCL15 without any hyphens or anything, you don't get any results from protocols.io. If you have a hyphen, you get 99 results. If you, if you enter a search result for CC-motif chemokine 15, which is the same entity, you get 420 results. Now this is very troublesome because they are the same molecule. And if you have a method using this molecule under one label, you should, it should be retrieved by the same search as using under another label. So let's try another one. Interleukin 8 yields 1,449 results, and CXCL8 also yields 1,449 results. So this is good news. Well, they think they're the same. But the problem is that these are probably the same too. And this one gives you 2,660 results. This one, which is the same thing, gives you 5,235 results. And CXCL8 gives you no results. So this is a problem. And the solution is ontology. So an ontolo there is an ontology of antibodies, which we actually made in Buffalo, which is a registry of the standard antibodies used in immunological research where we have one preferred label and then we have a list of all the other labels and using that ontology will mean it will ensure that all of your searches retrieve the same results for the same molecules now I know Lenny only at second hand so some of my ontologist friends tell me that first of all he's a good guy so you'll be reassured by that and secondly that he refuses to listen when people say the word ontology. So maybe he's not such a good guy after all. <laughs> all right, so this is Lenny. And then we come to the final cytokine chemistry bit. All right, so another solution which Ioannidis uh, proposed is that we change the p-value threshold from 5% to 0.5%. And of course, this means that we have to increase the sample sizes to the millions. So 
A clinical trial is going to need many, many subjects, and it's already expensive even to find the numbers of subjects that we use for clinical trials already. So we're talking about millions of samples. And that means we need big data, uh, which is the final proposed solution. And this is basically the solution also accepted by Atul Butte. Uh, science will become global. All the data about any given disease will be assembled together. And, um, and it will work because of ontology, of course, which will even take in the Russian data. Uh, not that we have anything against Russian data, except that it's in Cyrillic. Um, <laughs> All right, now, we need to have the same computable readable terms, but also the same computer readable definitions of all of those terms so that we can use the computer to, to analyze huge amounts of data. Get the human out of the loop. That's the, uh, the ultimate goal. And this, the, so the NIH has recognized that part of the solution to the replication crisis is going to involve the coordinated development of ontologies. All right, but now this is going to be a problem for pharmaceutical science. So we already know, because we've all tried it, that most pills don't work. But they do work for some people. So Abilify works for one in every five people, and Nexium works for one in every 25 people, I think it is. Uh, which means a lot of money is wasted by drug companies because they do their testing on samples which have not been pre-selected because no one knows who will be the ones for whom a given drug works until they've tested it and marketed it and then they have a big population and they can start to do studies as to which kinds of people the drug works for and which not. So under the standard medicine effect we can test everybody and get results which will seem to be valuable, even though most of them are a waste of money. Under the precision, tailored, personalized medicine effect, we will just study people for whom a drug will work, test it in them, and say it works for them, so we save a lot of wasted money. And the end result is that there'll be exactly one drug for every single person which is impossible, of course, because then we don't have any sample sizes. And so this is the key to happiness. <laughs> so you start with dopamine, which is in the chemistry ontology. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, which is also in the chemistry ontology. And the neurotransmitter receptor activity, which is the function of dopamine, is happiness. And so you have a drink on me now. <laughs> That's the next slide, but I've, 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 I've done my, I've had my fill now. So do we have questions? Or? I think questions would be lovely. He's saying no. No? Anyway, I'm, I'm here. Anyone want to ask a question? Yes. Are you aware of, of the efforts of Lenny to uh, discourage people from attending this conference? I've never heard of it. <laughs> well, Peter, please explain. No, I know. I know. Oh. I was, I was being funny. Oh. Uh, I've heard of you it. you consider him uh, too good? I am, to, to be uh, honest, I am surprised that he's wasting his time in doing what he's doing. He's got so many more important things to do. I have no idea why he did it. So, it, I, as, as, uh, as Peter explained, he got the wrong end of several sticks. Yes? I was just going to comment on searching. He believes he's the guru. Many, many years ago, in the 80s, I was at Bell Labs, where one of the most lucrative things was uh, yellow pages and searching. And um, when you have searching, there's a concept called fuzzy searching, where if you're searching for a dash or not a dash, it really doesn't matter. And even Google at the start, because they were searching through so many pages, if a few don't show up, nobody cares, right? It doesn't yeah. have to be accurate. Yeah. And so um, it, it's actually a function of the search, possibly, possibly, rather than the data that is in it. And to expect to get the same number of answers may not actually matter if you get a good answer for what you're looking for. Unless you get incorrect answer, one of them. Yeah. Well, 
you always do in Google, you get incorrect answers, but people have to um, work it out. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it is interesting, obviously, as you go mm -hmm. further and further with these things, you want to get them more and more accurate, and you want to have exactly what the person was looking for, but that's actually an extremely difficult search problem, particularly in the English language, mm -hmm. where we don't have as many words for snow, example, mm -hmm. as you might like. Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. There are two aspects uh, which need to be pointed out. First of all, we have all of these ontologies, particularly in biology, where the ontology approach has yeah, really... The ontology, I was one of the first users of dialogue in the 1970s, which was a search thing. So, um, and, and they always had an ontology and, a, you know, anyone who's got the dialogue pages... Right, uh, right. But now, and Google itself is beginning to use ontologies yeah, now. That's right. right. Uh, but uh, five years ago, Google was strenuously opposed to ontologies because they wanted to use a purely statistical method, fuzzy search, as you said. And, the, and we would say, well, you try and find uh, 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 cytokine motif 15 in Google, you will fail because Google will not pick up that phrase. But that phrase is, is very important. And then the second uh, point that you can make... Um, no, it's, it's gone. I won't make the second point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, can I continue the same thing? Yeah. Uh, that I, I don't know the uh, uh, terminology of cytokines, but uh, like in my field, and what I think usually happens is that when something is just new and developing, people discover them in parallel, they give them names, and then the names continue in parallel yep. for a while, then everyone gets sick of it, uh, they set up and you know start the ego when they should be. And yeah. Say, okay. Let's call it some name. Like in your uh, ad about the uh, sigma and millipoids, if, if it was. Yep. So then you know even though it's six fifty names, there are probably most of them are from the past. So. If somebody would search for it now. It would be the name that is currently used. Actually, there, there is still a difference. So gene names used to be a problem exactly like what you're describing. So people would discover a new gene in Philadelphia, and people would discover exactly the same thing in a gene in Singapore, and they'd give it two different names, and no one would know that they were talking about the same gene. They have now a gene name nomenclature committee, which makes sure that every gene has just one name, and of course, an associated sequence. They haven't done that for immunology. Immunology is still anarchy. And everyone knows it's anarchy. And, 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 and the ontologists are gradually trying to create the nomenclature harmony uh, that Lenny needs to learn about um, to bring us up to the same level there that we're already in the realm of gene names. I'm assuming he's here somewhere with, with a false mustache. <laughs> But I replied, you know, with logic, and he sent me back, you know, his reply. It was a very thoughtful conversation, and by the end, I felt that he uh, actually realized that maybe the right choice for him would be to come to the conference, but he didn't. So I should say... Okay, well, I congratulate you. Many, but he, I think he's a yeah. very good guy, and on top of everything, he has his right to express his opinion, he expressed it, and I don't see there's anything wrong with that. No, no, I, I'm not saying there is. Yes. I, I, I remain pessimistic, and after today's meeting, even more pessimistic, I have to say. Um, so I think the problem with, well, pro the problem with stopping publishing is that it would upend our entire academic uh, world, which may be a good thing. Uh, but perhaps we should keep medicine uh, in something like even keel while we scrap the other parts of the... Uh,
which are much more fundamental, at least the 10 truths, and should be conceivably implementable by all the silver haired folks in this room. My, my experience over 50 years as, as an environmental scientist is that the majority of people, courses teaching statistics, even in the best universities, are very deficient and out of date. And number two, the same applies to the textbooks. And I, we, it's, I love having these kinds of meetings with these fellow souls, but I think it's un, un, until people, including maybe the American Statistical Association, the NSA, the big NSA, I, uh, NAS, I think you mean. Are, are willing to bite, bite the bullet and have tougher book reviews. I mean, if yeah. that book comes out, and get, if it's got big problems in it, they should be nailed. Yeah. The book review editors don't like to be too critical of books. And then the, the courses, um, you know, you can just, those are harder to do, but without better statistics books available in all the different fields that use statistics, I agree. I think that probably the psychologists are aware that they have to do better in their statistics. Whether they are taking the necessary steps is another question, but at least they are very, very worried. Yeah? Um, yeah, so I'm curious. Um, is it too trivial to suggest that we just pay scientists to fact check other scientists? So actually, that that... That is another aspect which worries me. So I do a... The, ex the experts only have the ability to like, report on other yeah. experts. And so we have the whole commercial industry using yeah. these financial heuristics to question the commercializable potential of a discovery. And that's not the point. Yeah. But you're pointing in completely the wrong direction. In other words, while what you say is correct, it's going against all the forces, all the incentives. So I do a lot of peer reviewing. I get no reward. Um, where would the reward come from? Because in, increasingly journals are going out of business unless they publish open source online for which they don't really get income unless uh, faculty members or institutions pay $3,000 a paper for uh, publishing rights. So gradually the publishing industry is going to become poorer and poorer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so who's going to pay the uh, $1,000 that I would like to review a paper? Okay, so, but still the tendency is that they're going to get poorer and poorer. In, in science, anyway. Uh, yes? I thought ontology was a study of being. Apparently you're using it in some other way. So, the term ontology was introduced by, in the 16th century. Uh, it was basically the Latin for the Greek word metaphysics. And it meant what you just said. And it gradually grew and grew as a branch of philosophy. In, 19, in the 1970s, it, be, it began to be used by computer scientists to describe a, uh, a theory which would capture a certain domain of being, a certain domain of entities, whether, whether this be tables and chairs in a restaurant or mo molecule types in chemistry or uh, energy in physics. Each domain would get its own ontology, as they would say. Now, I'm a philosopher, but I became infected with this applied ontology. And so now I, I, my philosophy colleagues are very troubled. It's just naming. No, it's a lot more than that. It's defining the terms in such a way that computers can understand how different entities fit together, reason with them. Uh, understand things like protein reactions, or so, so chemical reactions between proteins. And, so right at the back. Yeah. I, I wanted to um, just say a very quick word about our friend who said that um, we need better statistics, because actually in the last two papers that I've just heard, people have said um, more, we need more sample, more, more, more um, items in the sample um, to give better about validation. That depends on the variance. If you have absolutely no variance yeah. in the sample, it won't matter how many people you have. So, um, you know, I, I'm just putting the statistics straight. 
And I, I bow to your superior wisdom. So right at the back. So I, was, I brought in Lehman because it was an analog, analogous hope that by means of pre-registration, you could avoid a problem. And I think that the hotel door example, which I found after I, I thought of using Lehman as my example, the hotel door example is a clearer illustration of my point. Pre-registration is not going to do any good unless you are very, very careful in specifying the rules for pre-registration. Mm -hmm. California state law did not specify the door rule very ke cleverly. So it's easy to cheat. What's the $999 per room. Just check your door, maybe it's more in your room. <laughs> yeah? In addition to the variance within the sample, you have variables that influence the sample outside of the sample. Right, right. No matter what your statistics are, they're not going to affect them. Right. Not going to, you're not going to be able to account for them. Right. So, yes? Uh, a lot of the discussion is what should the scientists and researchers do in order to improve things. Yeah. If you go back to Finley that went into Japan, he said that the only change of system is to get the managers of the system to change it. Workers generally are very happy with the current system, and they're not going to change it. So all this discussion of what can we do to the research, how can we register, how can we do this, and how can we do that, their incentives are to publish. And unless the funding agency and the journal editors change the system, the system is not going to change meaningfully. I agree. And the journal editors, some of them have tried to change the system and there has been pushback to some degree from authors. The NIH has tried to change the system and succeeded in some aspects. For instance, there's a lot more access to data than there would have been without the NIH. Um, yeah, exactly. And that's a good aspect. Yeah. And we should attempt to support these managers that are attempting to change the Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. I wasn't going to say anything, but the last commenter induces me to comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's face it, Barry, we're all academic whores of the federal government. We all are wards of the state. Every university in the United States, nearly every agency, the NIH itself with its $40 billion in annual grants that it drops out of airplanes over university campuses, and even in some cases to private firms, is the government. It's the government that's doing it. Why don't we look at what it's doing and whether there are alternative ways of doing this? I don't think we're talking about this. And I think that's what we should be talking about. Hmm. Not that we should necessarily bow to the ideological predilections of my revered friends at the Independent Institute or at the National Association of Scholars, which Peter will tell you quite correctly, has no ideological predilection whatsoever. We're interested in the truth, period. <coughs> but it has been distorted by the political process. And it has been distorted mightily by the political process. And until we talk about those things, we're talking around the edge. That's all I have to say. Is this an edge question? free and open market. 
And if we look back through human history, it's worked. It's going to work this time, regardless of what we say. I mean, that would be my best. So are we not because market I participants? I want to know that what I publish is correct and that I get rewarded for that. I mean, that's the basic thing that drives us. <laughs> Uh, let me just offer one counterexample. Great. Environmental health perspective. Huge impact factor. Lots of people subscribe to it. It's full of absolute garbage, in my opinion, in, in, in terms of statistical quality. Hasn't slowed it down a bit. Okay, so one last question. <laughs> yes? Do your work on also kind of Yes? Yes? In reference to Richard's question, how would you connect that to NIH journal? That's a really complicated question. Uh, so a long time ago, I published a, a number of a number of uh, pieces on the on, on the ontology of Austrian economics. But now ontology being understood much more in the philosophical sense rather than in the um, in the, the applied ontology sense that I'm using today. So. In the applied ontology world, we really are focusing on terminology and getting terminology right. Now, I think that this is, this is a really difficult job, and it, it's a completely other series of talks, but it does actually respond to um, uh, Richard and, and to your question a little bit. So I think that many of the terms used in economics are in need of some kind of ontological definition that would be rigorous. And I'm thinking of terms like commercial exchange, or buying, or selling, or preferring, or valuing. Uh, not because I, I want to defend one or other particular economic school, just because I think it's an important, it could be an important contribution to bringing about rec replicability in areas such as uh, economics. So that's, that's my do you, do you consider Brentano your sort of ground? Okay, so Brentano was one of the first philosophers that I took seriously as an ontologist, but this was in a former millennium. Um, and he, in one of his works, which was about the soul, the ontology of the soul, Brentano has, um, a, 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 in the frontispiece, a dedication <coughs> to Aristotle, from his favorite son. So I, I'm, I don't think of myself as Aristotle's son, but maybe his step-great-great-grandson, something like that. <laughs>